Welcome to ClueCon Weekly. Join us every Wednesday to learn about the latest cutting-edge developments in the real-time communications industry. ClueCon Weekly is brought to you by FreeSwitch Solutions. Get support and professional services directly from the creators of the FreeSwitch open source project, solving your issues in the most efficient, stable, and scalable way possible. Get the FreeSwitch advantage. Visit freeswitch.com. Also brought to you by ClueCon, the premier technology conference for developers by developers. Join us every summer in Chicago. ClueCon kicks off on Monday with our annual hackathon, The Coder Games, followed by three days of technology-rich presentations discussing telecom, WebRTC, and IoT from developers around the world. To learn more, visit cluecon.com or call 877-74-A-CLUE. And welcome to ClueCon Weekly. Today is the 24th of October, and this week we're going to be joined by Lynn Graham. Uh, Lynn has been around the community for a while, and he's a heavy free switch user, Fusion PBX user, and he's done some other uh, cool stuff that he's going to be showing us later today, so you guys stand by for that. Uh, first, let's go over and see Miss Abby for the news. Abby, how are you doing today? Uh-oh, start over. You are muted. Oh, it says I'm not muted, so. Yep. Okay. So how are you? <laughs> what? How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? <laughs> Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today on ClueCon Weekly. So as always, if you have any questions during this call, feel free to comment them in the YouTube, HipChat, or IRC channels, and we will try to answer them live during this call. And if you're watching us live on YouTube right now, please give us a share. Uh, also, make sure to follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, LinkedIn, and follow our newsletter to make sure that you're staying up to date with the Free Switch team. And of course, it is never too early to start thinking about ClueCon. So our early bird registration for ClueCon is starting very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, it's going to be $699.99 if you are staying at the hotel. So make sure to watch out for more announcements on that. Uh, this year, we're still at the Swiss Hotel in downtown Chicago. But this time, we're going back to our normal dates. We're going to be there from August 5th through August 8th. So. The Free Switch team had an amazing time in Orlando, Chicago, and San Francisco. So we sent out a whole bunch of photos on our newsletter. So if you're following our newsletter, make sure to go and open that email and you can see what we've been up to. And if you're not following our newsletter, now would be a great time to do so. All right. Thank you all for listening. Back to you, Ken. All right. Thank you very much, Abby. Uh, now, guys, we're going to jump over to uh, Jersey Mike for Community Corner. Jersey, who you got with us? So we have a question um, for Mike Jarris, and the question comes from a community member, uh, Michael Hubbard. And Michael Hubbard asks, hi guys, I want to identify the source of inbound calls. My external, in my external profile, I have two gateways, one that's registering and one that's not registering. In my dial plan, I have this, this configuration. Um, condition field, SIP gateway, expression, gateway one, um, and the same for gateway two. When a call arrives through gateway one registered, SIP underscore gateway is populated with GW1, perfect. But when another call arrives through gateway two, which, you, which is not registered, SIP underscore gateway is empty. Please, how can I identify the source gateway when the call arrives? Maybe it's not a good way to do that. Uh, so Mike, all right. What's the scoop? What's the scoop? All right. So the mechanism that we use for determining if there is a SIP gateway to populate that SIP gateway variable, there are two mechanisms. The first one is if we receive... Um, in a URL param on the request URL, GW plus in the gateway name, we will match that. The second way is if the actual destination number is GW plus in the gateway name, we will also match that as, uh, as the gateway name and set the SIP gateway. What we do not do is match anything like the IP address that the call is coming from. 
Um, you do have the capability of doing that manually by looking at the network IPs um, or something of that sort uh, for the calls coming in and manually doing expressions or uh, expressions using our ACL framework to match those. Um, but we don't go and actually look up the gateway. It also means we don't do anything related to, say, you had um, anything set on the gateway that would take effect if we matched it uh, in those cases. Um, the way that the GW Plus gets into the URL params is when we send out a register um, that is in the contact of the register. Um, so another issue that people frequently have is even on registering ones, um, what a client should do is include those URL params when they send a call to that register. There are many things out there that are broken that do not do that. Um, so that's another case, even with register, that they won't show up. Um, so your options are um, to look at uh, the gateway name or, and to have another condition that's specific to the IP address. Um, we just don't have a feature that looks up the IPs automatically. It, uh, it, something with a lot of gateways, it can get very expensive very quick to look at that on every incoming invite. So we uh, we don't do that and leave that as something that you can manually do if you choose so. Okay, so just to sum it up, with the existing dial plan that they have <coughs> in the mailing list, it'll work if they use the plus, right? It, and if they wanted to additionally modify the dial plan, they can use an ACL. Yeah, or it, try to match the IP address like they did later in the thread. Yeah, so if if they have control over what is sent to them, um, somehow like it's a manual URL and they can insert URL params into how the call is sent to them, um, some some providers that do manual mapping would allow for that. Um, you can just put GW plus gateway name in the URL params of the um, – that would come into the request you get, and that would also make it match, even though it's a non-registering gateway. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> Answers from the experts. And now to Abby for blog stop. All right, hi guys, I am back. So if you don't read our free switch blog, make sure to go over to our website and give that a click. We have a lot of exciting things that we're talking about on there. For example, today, I am very excited to be talking about this topic because I wrote about it and it turned out to be way more controversial than I thought it would be. So today we are talking about smartwatches. So smartwatches were on everybody's mind when they came out back in 2014, and they definitely weren't a catastrophe in the tech market, but they definitely were not selling well as businesses would have liked them to, uh, because when they were first advertised, the feature sounded really cool and groundbreaking, like, oh, technology for your wrist. Uh, it gave you access to a lot of new features, uh, like you could tell the time. You could receive notifications, send text messages, play games, track your health, call an Uber, order food, keep track of your calendar, except for all of these things sound exactly what your cell phone can do, except for smaller, and in my opinion, worse. But that's where the controversy comes in. So, but con uh, consumers were definitely not as impressed with wearable functionality as uh, manufacturers were hoping they would be. So in response, a lot of companies doubled down on the smartwatches, really doubled down on the advertising, trying to make them cooler. But a lot of other companies like Pebble and Martian are actually pulling smartwatches and wearables from their production because they're not doing as well as they should be. Uh, Apple Watches, on the other hand, are actually doing pretty well. Uh, they actually make up about 40% of all smartwatch sales. And that's because Apple is the king of brand loyalty. Uh, they also have that wonderful feature where all of their products are super compatible between each other. But other brands like Samsung, Android, they're not doing as well as they want to be doing. Smartwatches just really aren't introducing any new and groundbreaking features. And even bigger, app developers aren't really interested in making new apps for smartwatches simply because not enough people download it and it's not worth their time to make. However, 
Market research shows that people really, really, really love two very specific things about smartwatches, and it's the easiest functions they have, which is sending us notifications and sending us our fitness tracking. So if smartwatches are such a fail, I was wondering how are they still on the market? So I did a little research, and it turns out that the fashion industry loves smartwatches. So even a regular watch, people don't really need watches anymore to tell the time because you know everybody has a cell phone, so they're not really necessary. People wear watches because they want to. Uh, it's a fashion statement, especially for a lot of businessmen and businesswomen. Your watch says something about who you are and how you present yourself to the world. So people wear watches more to make a statement rather than its functionality. So a lot of brands are deciding that instead of convincing tech enthusiasts to start wearing watches, Appleware is pivoting and they've partnered with a lot of popular fashion brands like Kate Spade, Fossil, Michael Kors, Tommy Hilfiger, and a million more different brands to create designer smartwatches and flood the market with different shapes and styles of wearables. You can even change your watch face to match which outfit you're wearing. So do, they're trying to uh, trying to market it to people who already wear watches, and they're adding these tech features more as a bonus instead of uh, its entire function. Uh, a lot of these uh, smartwatches are actually hybrids. They're equipped with Bluetooth, Bluetooth notifications and fitness tracking only, since that's what they discovered people really, really, really want. So what I find really interesting about this is uh, this pivot in wearables really shows the breadth of the technology revolution. Uh, tech technology is moving away from its own market category and it's starting to blend into our everyday lives and our consumption habits, which I think is really cool. Uh, so I know a lot of people really love their smartwatches and some of them don't. So I would love to know what you guys think. Let me know either in the comments of this video or send us a tweet whether you, why you love your smartwatch or why you hate it or why you're a little bit indifferent. I'm very curious because a lot of people have a lot of good opinions on this. All right. Thanks for listening. Back to you guys. All right, we're going to have Mike and Lynn join us now. Mike, how you guys doing? Good. So we all know Lynn from the Fusion PBX project. He works with Mark. Um, Mark is the principal author, but Len helps out quite a bit. Um, so Len, what do you have for us today? Hey, there you are. What's going on, Len? How's it going? <laughs> it's going. Um, I paused there for a little bit when I unmuted. Uh, so what's new with Fusion PBX? What's new? Everything is always new. There's always changes, pull requests. Um, so I thought I would do a topic on working with Fusion PBX. Um, I'm a contractor for Fusion PBX, so I'm not exactly an employee. But um, a few things I'll go over here as soon as I find it. <laughs> okay, so first I, I wanted to go over the Fusion PBX documentation, which is something that uh, I've done the majority of the work on with the direction of Mark Crane of Fusion PBX. So everything that you see and everything that you don't see is directed by, by Mark. Uh, but we're always open for suggestions on things that uh, you would like to see. So um, if there's something that isn't in the documentation, definitely reach out to us. And, uh, you know, we'll try to get that added. So, so, so the documents, when you created the documents, um, they're done with um, what system? So what this uses uh, is a few different things. It uses um, Read the Docs and uh, GitHub. Um, so with GitHub, you can treat documentation as, as, as you would code. So um, like on this page here, we have uh, like the opening page. You can click on Edit on GitHub. And this will take you to the page where it's hosted on GitHub. So if you want to, you can see the raw content of the formatting. So if you wanted to introduce a page, you can say, well, how do I make the formatting or how do I make it look like that? Or how do I make something look bold or 
you know, how, how do I make a table? It's all, you know, within the, the code that you can just take a look and say, well, oh, so that's how you do that. That's how you make links. Um, right. So that is that is that done in Ruby or Python? Uh, it's uh, done in uh, Python, I believe. But this is a, a restructured text, a .rst type of uh, file format, where it's um, a little confusing sometimes. It's there's a lot of different uh, learning curves with this type of uh, documentation. Um, here you, you can see there you can't see the embedded YouTube code, but it's there. It's right here. But the one thing about the Fusion PBX documentation is um, if you've ever used Fusion PBX, you'll notice the menu at the top of the screen of like home, accounts, you know, dial plan application. And what we try to do is follow that same flow with documentation. So you want to know about accounts, you click on accounts. You know, if you want to see about the different providers uh, that are included in the newest branch of Fusion PBX, you can click there. Um, you know, if you want to know about... Um, Devices, you can go to devices, and um, I believe in both of a you know visual and a, a textual, I guess, kind of a approach to uh, documentation. There's different types of people that learn um, through either you know videos or through pictures or even just through text. So right. I try to. Try and to so find that documentation, if you need to find something and learn something about a specific area of Fusion PBX, you can use this search function. Absolutely. So it's kind of like Google. You know, most people don't do it, but it's really cool whenever you do do it. <laughs> um, so if I wanted to search for, you know, Let's Encrypt. I hit enter. There's different pages on Let's Encrypt. So we'll click on the first one here. How does Let's Encrypt work? Let's so talk Let's about that. Let's Encrypt is um, an SSL provider that's for free. And it's really nice that, um, you know, there's companies sponsoring, you know, a project like that where you can secure your, your website, you can secure, um, you know, your voice communications. Uh, through TLS, um, but the way it works is you um, basically send. A, um, I'm sure people can explain it better than me, but um, just like a generic explanation is, you send a request, you know, for the uh, domain, um, and then uh, the request comes back, and um, pretty much you got a Let's Encrypt uh, SSL certificate. Um, so what um, Mark did is um, he generated a script uh, that's part of the uh, Fusion PBX installation um, that you could download. And um, whenever you run the script, it asks you know for your domain name. Uh, you can do like a wildcard um, type of uh, certificate that would include all um, like subdomains. So you can have like a dot fusionpbx.com or b.fusionpbx.com in all one certificate opposed to if you just do like a like a host name uh, just a.fusionpbx.com um, but you know the, either way that it each has its purpose um, and so that certificate's good for a couple months right yeah it's about 90 days i believe um, but you can um, set up um, cron jobs in order to renew it um, Debian has um, something in, in place through uh, System D that you can trigger for it to renew. Uh, not everyone likes uh, System D, so it's not included in the documentation. <laughs> but um, but if you wanted to, um, you know, secure your website um, that's recognized by different phone vendors like um, uh, like, like Yealink. Um, you know, you can use this script, and there's just, um, you know, like a general how to do that. Um, it uses uh, Dehydrated, which is uh, uh, another open source type of uh, project. I believe it's MIT license, which is one of the cooler licenses. But, um, so if you want to learn about um, how to use um, 
you know, let's encrypt with Fusion PBX. This is a page to do it. And, you know, searching is one of the ways to do it. And the cool thing is, um, whenever you search for something, you can kind of familiarize yourself with how the menu works too. So if you look on the left side here, you can see that, um, you know, where is this in the documentation? Well, it's underneath getting started. And then um, let's encrypt. And then there's like some subjects like the dehydrated and using it. And you click on that and it takes you right to it. Um, if you're not a fan of the highlighting, let's go up to the URL here, delete it, hit enter. And then it takes the highlighting away. So let's so encrypt. Let's um, actually, uh, the certificates are automatically generated when Fusion's installed, correct? Not automatically. Um, I believe there's an answer file that you can do that to with, um, but it's not 100% done yet. Um, things with open source um, are on a tight budget, so things are done um, on like a priority list of, of you know priorities, I guess you can say. Um, but this is the uh, documentation. It's um, right, but the, the the power of open source is that anyone could just take care of that and just you know fork it and um, essentially you know, contribute it back to Mark, right? And so we oh, can absolutely. have that functionality on the install. Yeah, that that's that's so cool. I mean, you can, you know, like as I was saying before, you can click on edit on, on GitHub and say, well, maybe I don't like the way this is worded or maybe I want to include something a little bit more. You just click on the edit. Now this is um, going to show up right on the Fusion PBX Fusion Docs uh, repo. Um, right. So the, 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 imp the important note is it's not it's not tied to something financial. I'm sorry. The important thing to note is because it's open source and the, and the contributions come back that it's not something that's based on finances. Right. That, that's the beauty of, of it. You know, this is all something that everyone can contribute to. Um, and if you want to just make a small edit, you don't really need to know. Get GitHub can be intimidating. Uh, whenever you're first learning it, um, and even once you're using it for a while, it's like, why is this doing this? <laughs> kind of thing. Or you can go right in your browser. Um, you can click on edit, and you know you'll get a little note saying that you know once you're logged into GitHub, um, you know it's going to make a branch within your own repo. So I can say let's encrypt. Say one is one of. I can say is. Um, maybe I'll do that. Is the most recent. And widely used, so I can say, um, propose file change. And then it even shows you, like, what was changed, you know, this whole block. Oh, so Mark just came in on chat and he says, we don't ask any questions during the install. Install, let's inscript.sh ask questions. So the, re the requirements are domain name and email. Right. If you were to run the Let's Encrypt script separately, it would ask you for the domain name and the email address. So, so, on here. so Len, what's what what if 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 there's a new contributor to uh, Fusion, what would the typical process flow go? Because they have to they have to fill out some documentation ahead of time, right? Right. Um, so, just to finish this point here, you would just click on uh, Create Pull Request. To say, you know, I updated Let's Encrypt, create pull request, create pull request. And that'll go into the commits. You can see it's number 155. Uh, it's not something that I want to commit, so I'm just going to close the pull request. And then that'll go away. And you'll notice that it shows as closed. But back to your question, Michael. Um, so if I want to go back to, let's see, we'll go back to docs pbx.com and there's a section for contributing so if i want to contribute to fusion pbx um, oh, there's even a, a youtube video that i put together um, that's something that mark sponsored um, you know i can't thank mark enough you know he's helped uh, you, know, you know a lot of people including myself um, you know with the documentation 
um, you know, more than one way. So, you know, definitely thank you, Mark, for that. But um, for um, if you want to contribute to the project, um, you know, follow the um, YouTube video, um, and it'll it'll show you how to do that. Uh, let's see. I guess that covers the YouTube videos. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can go to the youtube.com slash fusion PBX. And it can drop out there. All right. So, next, I wanted to talk. You still with me, Michael? Yes. I'm here. All right. Is the uh, ClueCon 2018? So, like, I've been wanting to go to ClueCon for like years now, and like the stars aligned, and I was able to go. It was so awesome. Um, so yeah, thank Klu you. Yeah, ClueCon. ClueCon's amazing. Yeah, there was you know a lot of people that made it happen. So thank you to the, everyone that the, you know that made that happen uh, for me. Um, so I, I wanted to do like a, a recap of the dangerous demos. Um, that's part of the um, ClueCon event and this is a screenshot of the uh, video that I don't, I don't know can you see up here Michael it looks like uh, kind of like a white blob hmm? like a clear plastic kind of kind of thing here but yeah, what we, it, you know James Bodie's amazing you know he, he his dangerous demos are you know it's one of the most you know entertaining uh, components of some of these things because you know, sometimes there's so much information to kind of lighten it up a little bit. You know, it, it, it breaks it, it it breaks up all the you know all the all the all the information with you know something that's a little bit lighter. Absolutely, but um, just like a short story on it, um, Mark and I were um, outside of the uh, event where the vendors were. And, uh, and Bodhi came up to us and was like, hey, you know, there was a, a cancellation with one of the participants, you know, can you participate? And we're like, uh, you know. <laughs> um, so um, you know, we, we got talked into it, but it was a cool experience. Um, it was like right before. And so, so you guys actually, you guys, you guys won one of the awards, didn't you? Yeah, I think it was like uh, most creative or something, or most entertaining. And we got this like um, that's cool. This uh, glass uh, plaque thing. It was like huge or plexiglass or I don't know. I don't know. It was like glass or plexiglass. It was like a had a three D um, engraving inside. It was it was so cool. Um, but what we did is uh, we took a, a Raspberry Pi um, Zero W. So it's like one of those tiny. Raspberry Pis with Fusion PBX on it, um, and we attached it to a, a battery bank, all right, and we wrapped it in uh, bubble wrap. So that's what this thing is right here. And so we essentially threw a PBX around the room, uh, uh, playing catch with it, while Mark was demonstrating the, the features on it. What we wanted to do, which unfortunately we didn't accomplish, um, was to um, make a call through the uh, GrandStream app, GrandStream Wave, uh, through QR provisioning, um, and um, something but happened. End, got, but in the end, you got billed, you, you you got banned by um, fail to ban, right? <laughs> yeah, we got banned by fail to ban because it was um, just the way everything came together. Um, I forgot some minor details, and we got banned. Um, but it was cool to see it happen, you know, live. Um, you know, Jairus caught it and took a light or two it almost. So it was kind of funny. But but it was just really neat to see the engagement with the, the audience. Just, you know, everyone was, was having fun, came together. Um, so, you know, just to, to be, you know, my first experience with ClueCon and all of a sudden I'm up on stage with it. You know, it was cool. For me, just to be there to help set everything up, be with everyone, and then that was like, you know, blew me away. So thank you. It was awesome. Um, 
and like the the battery bank that I used, it like failed. So I was like, Josh, can you help me? And he's like, Yeah, I have a battery bank. So I used Josh's um, battery bank to to power the the pie with. So the question is, are you going to enter into dangerous demos next year? It's it's a good question. Um, probably if if I get there. Um, um, you know, things with open source are always, you know, day to day, so it's hard to say what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but if everything goes according as planned, then yeah, I'll, I'll be there. I, you know, would love to help set up again, and you know, it's fun to be part of something. But um, next, I wanted to touch um, upon um, using. Verto Communicator with Fusion PBX, so uh, not a lot of people know that you can do that. Um, you know, there's a lot of customizations that go into it, but um, you know, if you purchase the Mastering Free Switch book, um, it'll help you understand a little better on how to, how to do that, and that's pretty much what what I did. Um, you know, without that knowledge, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be able to do that because I'm not really a, a, a a developer by say, um, you know, I can follow directions pretty well usually, um, or reading books, uh, literature, Google searching, things like that. But um, I, I just wanted to show, like, um, you know, whenever you join a conference, this is what it looks like if you go to the, the active, active calls. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah, it's a, you're talking about the, appli the application string? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, you know, that'll show you like the, the profile, like the, um, I use 8081 to call in. So in my Fusion PBX, I went to apps and conferences, um, created um, um, a profile or um, a conference name of 8081 uh, with ex with the virtual extension of, of 8081 um, and, and then dialed into it. This is what it looks like in Fusion PBX. So, um, you know, if I wanted to kill that conference, I just hit the X and the conference is over. Um, and it just shows you there, you can go to apps and conferences. And then, um, so it's a little fun with Fusion PBX and, well, more more so with, with Virto Communicator. Uh, just showing what well, you, have, you, have, you have a demo for us with Virto, right? right. Um, I don't think it'll work because I'm using the webcam that I'm using Virto with right now. So if I use Virto on two different machines, it'll one of them will will win, <laughs> and I don't I don't think it'll be the one I want. Um, so what I did is I, I took screenshots of it instead. Um, so this this shows like the administrative controls and like the video overlay of like the stuff at, at the bottom. If I said that right. Um, you know, here's an image. <laughs> there you go. There's a thumbs up. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I, I have to do work at night because I have kids at home and sometimes they're not quiet. Um, so that's why it's all, all dark in the background. Everyone was sleeping. So there's some more fun. So the kind of the, I don't know if it's different, if, if you can tweak this, but whenever you um, mute yourself, once it kind of like saves it and then whenever you unmute you know it resumes and if you mute again it'll mute that first muted image but here's um about the mastering free switch book um so and so giovanni was actually on last week yeah so this is a uh, kind of like a nice segue from that um uh you know it's these books are in invaluable um you know if you haven't bought one already, which I know a lot of people have, buy one because you know it helps. It helps you. It helps everyone. Um, so here's just the link if you wanted to go um, the Pack T um, publishing company apparently has it on sale for ten bucks. So you know, save yourself a latte and and buy uh, you know mastering free switch instead. And then tomorrow you can have a latte and then read your Mastering Free Switch book. Um, but what I did is I, I took the example. Um, so there's um, 
like a WebRTC example. Um, and um, so I, I got permission to do this. So, you know, thank you, Giovanni, for that permission um, in order for me to do this. So I'm always worried about what you can do and what you can't do um, with these kind of things. So it's always good to get permission. Um, so what I did is I took a from the book um, and I pretty much uh, baked it. I changed it from HTML to PHP, uh, wrapped it into um, like a, a Fusion PBX app. Um, so I took something that was already existing in Fus Fusion PBX, kind of looked and seen how it worked, and adapted it. And um, and now that's so, that's part of the base install of Fusion, right? Um, the WebRTC app is separate, so it, um, you can develop your own apps and then add them in separately. Um, so the WebRTC app from the Mastering Free Switch book that I baked, um, it is available. Um, it's in like a repo by itself um, from like the mainstream repo. Okay. But uh, you can certainly add that. Um, so what this is... Um, but it's publicly available. If yeah, it's pu to publicly available. It. So this is what it looks like. Um, so this is... When I found um, about the whole crashing thing about having two different Vertos going, so this uses uh, I believe the Verto communication or um, library, if I said that right, and um, so I was using Verto communicator also, and whenever I did that, um, the one froze. That's why I'm showing like two images here. Right. So 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 there's device permissions, and once you provide device permissions, it's you know essentially exclusive. But it's so cool. I mean, you can like message with uh, another participant. So it was just me in there. So that's, you know, I named it Lenman and I said hello. Um, but I can probably show that screen. I don't know. So if I go to apps and then down to the WebRTC, I'm already there. Oh, I have to log in. So once you log in, As it logs in, as it logs in, uh, you can see I made a couple calls. <laughs> what did you just go to apps? You always do when you're testing, right? Oh, that's yeah, testing. Uh, you can see I'm testing on uh, ReSwitch Master Branch. Um, let's go down to app and then WebRTC. So conference, um, I'll try it. 80, 81. We'll do eighty-one one. That's in the free switch book, the mastering free switch book also, um, about the uh, the moderated part of it, um, where you have like a DAO plan and it uses an extra one as like a moderated user, which is really cool. Um, and then you just put in what it, what your name you want it to be. Um, I put Squidward because I'm I'm a fan of SpongeBob. Uh, so we'll say Len and then call conference. Not sure what this will do, so we'll see what happens. Yep, they crashed. So <laughs> what it did, it just went back. Um, but if I wanted to, I can go to status and then log viewer, and then I can look at the logs and see, you know, what exactly may have happened. Well, we'll take a look. You could just inspect it, inspect it to see what happened as well. Right. Okay. I have the logs turned on kind of heavy, so it shows passwords, so I'm not going to scroll down too much. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, you can scroll down. You can see, you know, verdo.rtc slash 80811 um, has been answered. See how far we can get down. Then you'll see, you know, ringing, and then it'll show that it executed. And... Yeah, probably as far as we'll go. Windows is complaining. Alright, did I crash or am I still good? Nope, you're, you're still on. Okay. 
Alright. I'm on a uh, laptop that's a first core i7 and it doesn't play nice all the time, so but I would double check. But um but yeah, um if you just circling back to documentation, um, you know, there's training available, you know, there's free training, which is um, you know, the documentation, YouTube. Um, there's also uh, paid trainings, um, which I know um, FreeSwitch has trainings also. Um, so you know you should always sign up for trainings, or else you know things like free, free uh, open open source doesn't really work that well unless there's some sort of revenue income. So Len, tell us what else is new with uh, Fusion PBX. Um, there's things in Massive that are. Um, Currently, I'm trying to think of what's new applications. The uh, Grand the Grandstream Wave app, um, which does uh, QR code provisioning, that's pretty new. So, you have an extension. You just open up your Grandstream Wave app. Um, you know, hold up the phone and. A couple and the Grandstream the Grandstream Wave app is actually free, right? Yeah, that's free. No, no P codes involved. I don't know if you do any uh, work with uh, provisioning templates. Um, Grandstream use um, uh, something called P tags, and they can be uh, confusing. Confusing sometimes. <laughs> um, there's uh, messaging that's new. I don't think we have that in the documentation. So where you can re receive SMS uh, messaging. Uh, so that's cool. There's uh, two different providers um, that that's Hey, Mark, available. how you doing? I, I, I see you keep on sending some messages on the side. Do you want to just pop in for a second and say hello? Hello. <laughs> hey, Mark, what's going on? Going pretty well. So um, Len just pointed out Grandstream Wave QR code provisioning. That's on the master branch. Um, the other thing improved the imports. Added uh, imp ability to import uh, extensions, destinations, devices, voicemail, uh, six items. So setting up Fusion can go faster. And that's really important for the types of companies that have, you know, large amount of extensions have, have you know, it's hard to switch existing infrastructure. So if they had, you know, I mean, if they had, if they had another, they had access to another database, they can export it into an existing format and then re-import it in Fusion and then just swap DNS and move right in. Absolutely. So, uh, and other than that, polishing up, fixing bugs, uh, working on security, improving the provisioning templates because that's always a, um, a lot of work. So. Uh, anyway, that's uh, Len's done pretty pretty well. Uh, good job, Len. Thanks, Mark. I don't. I don't want to take it over. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, Len. I think it was really good. Well, thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. I'm I'm usually the quiet one, so I'm usually in the background. So this is uh, a little bit different for me. Well, it's good. To, it's good to see you out in front. That's for sure. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. A little nervous. I don't know if, if that came across at all. But, uh... <laughs> and the dangerous demo was loads of fun. Definitely want to do <laughs> that again. It was I remember. I, I remember because I was I was in one of the side rooms, and you guys both came in. You were so excited. You just, you just kept on talking about it. <laughs> That that that's part of the magic of dangerous demos. It, it really is. It's it, it's not just like it's entertaining for the crowd and it breaks up like all this like technical stuff. But like at the end, it's good. It it, it brings up people's spirits. It, it kind of like you know after all that like dawning information of like oh my god I got to learn this I got to learn that I got to you know there there's so much just technology that's discussed that it, it, it's nice to have something that kind of lightens up the whole scene a little bit and so james is great at doing that that's for sure i think we had like an hour or something like that mark wasn't it 
before the dangerous demo. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have very much time when we finally decided uh, on what we figured out something to do. Uh, oh, that was your lead time. Yeah, and then yeah. and then we. we kept <laughs> That's connected. awesome that you guys put that together so quickly. I can I can tell you that. I give you a lot of credit for that. And we connected to the hotel's Wi-Fi first, but then we wouldn't be able to get to it. So. You've been watching KluCon Weekly. Tune in every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central. Keep up with the latest happenings by subscribing to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit us at freeswitch.com. Was it something I said, Ken? Yeah. I'm not sure what happened there. But let's get this back to where it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so is that like a false rap? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so back to Dangerous Demos. Um, awesome. All right, whoever, uh, I'm going to, sorry guys, I'm going to interrupt. Whoever is screwing with the screen controls, please stop right now. You are affecting a live broadcast, and I will find you, and I will use my special skills. Stop now, please. Sorry about so that. So, Len, what else is new with Fusion? Let's talk about that. <laughs> Um, well, there's been a, a lot of security work done, um, so that that's something that's new. You know, security is always, you have to stay on top of it, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, because yeah. people, people can't have nice things, so. Well, one of the things I've always liked about Fusion is a lot of the GUIs that work in conjunction with open source PBXs, they'll have, like... You know, static passwords. <laughs> Fusion never had that, right? So it's randomly generated. Right. So when the scanners come through, you're not instantly compromised, right? It's it's pretty hardened on on a fresh install. Um, there's always things that that you can further do to make things more secure. Um, you know, you can change uh, from registering to the IP address to not registering uh, to the IP address. Um, which is recommended not to register to the uh, server's IP address because that's usually what the script people like to do. You is know, one of the things we do with free switch is we put in like a delay. So like there is, there, there's a hard coded password, you know, at, at, in the vanilla config, but if you make a call, there's a delay. <laughs> and there's big text that say, do not use this password. <laughs> <laughs> but with Fusion, it's nice on, on a, a brand new install. I, I mean, you, there's an answer file that you can put your own password in, both for the database and for the super user login username and password. Um, or you can just leave it as random. When you leave it as random, then it's, well, it's just that. So, what are some of the other security enhancements? Um, a lot of um, the pages um, have uh, work that has been done. Uh, I won't say exactly what because of the nature of the security issues, but um, you know, it's something that once things happen, you, you have to fix it. Have you used uh, Fusion PBX before, Michael? Me? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember actually probably, I don't know how many years ago it was, but I, I, I went through all the trainings. And, and what I found really interesting was it, it was it was before I really got involved in telecommunications. <laughs> so, um, I remember learning things about free switch, just, you know, Mark would go off on these tangents as he was teaching the class and there would be like just general things that you'd learn about free switch in there. And I remember thinking, okay, so, you know, just picking up some of those little like kudos of information um, is really nice. 
you know, the, the trainings are awesome. Um, you know, there's the admin training, the advanced training. Now there's a monthly continuing education. Um, and that's something that I, I, I help with too. It, it's nice to be part of yeah, that. You're in on every one of those, right? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, there, there's some I missed, but uh, uh, pretty much uh, every one of them. There's There was a developer's one um, to, to use the Fusion PBX API, uh, which a lot of people don't know that, that that's available too. Um, so that, that's you know something uh, some people don't know about with Fusion PBX. There's, uh, like I came from a proprietary world um, of like cable companies, um, you know, uh, multiple service operators, um, where everything was, you know, you took it off the shelf and you sold. You, you just you were a reseller pretty much. Um, so, which there's a lot of learning with that too. You know, learn about the porting process, about um, you know phone numbers and nine one one and you know, all that happy jazz. And then uh, to be introduced to open source, it's like, you mean, if there's something that I don't like, I can change it. <laughs> you know, that's just like mind blowing. And not, you know, be stuck behind some sort of weird contract that you're stuck into something that only works on, you know, Firefox 9 or you know, something weird like that. That is the power of open source. So why don't we start taking some questions from the audience? Well, thank you for coming in today, Len. Ken, back to you. All right, guys. Well, it looks like uh, we don't have too many questions today. So thanks, Len. Thanks, uh, Mike Malbrutus. And uh, thanks, everybody else, for joining us today. We'll be back here next week. And uh, so you can know when we go live, while you're watching the YouTube video, right below there's a subscribe button. And there's a little bell. Click the subscribe button and click the bell, and you'll get the alerts when we go live and we press, uh, post new videos. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great weekend. You've been watching KuCon Weekly. Tune in every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Central. Keep up with the latest happenings by subscribing to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit us at freeswitch.com.